I went to school and I took my boards and those kinds of things. So pretty proud to be a CBT at Dove Lewis. Um, so I have tried to cut this down into about an hour. Usually I talk for almost two at our pet first aid trainings. Um, so I'll try and get, get everything in there and hopefully it'll make sense and I'll keep an eye on the, the chat too. All right. And I gotta figure out how to change it to the next slide. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so first off, um, the takeaway is that pet first aid is not a substitute for veterinary care. Um, you know, it's really hard to know what is going on with our pets sometimes with lacerations or wounds or when they're acting differently over the phone, um, sometimes even in person without really doing a thorough, a thorough exam. Um, so, and knowing history and those kinds of things. Um, so any first aid should be followed up immediately with veterinary care. Um, I'll talk about some items that you can have in your pet first aid kit uh, for say a minor bandage. And when I talk about those kinds of things that you can do at home, it's to be followed up by veterinary care. Because if you're putting a bandage on your pet, first off, I worked for an orthopedic surgeon for a little while and he made me practice bandaging many, many times before he was like, okay, you have the green thumb. I don't have to check you off anymore. Because if you put on a bandage too tight, then you could be cutting off circulation to your pet's foot or tail or something like that and then causing more harm. So next is stay, stay safe and do no harm. Um, veterinary professionals, and I think humans too, take an oath to do no harm. Um, so we can't help pets if we are not safe. So that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And also we wanna make sure that what we do is not gonna cause more harm in the process. Right, so you can find um, many, many pet first aid kits that are put together and that's great. If that's easy and you wanna purchase one online, um, you know, the, the typical ones come with the same kinds of things, bandage material, cleaning aids, gloves, those kinds of things, it's great. But you can also put your own together because you really don't need like that bucket size worth of stuff. Um, so I have a list of things that I think, and everybody who has different types of pets will, um, or, or uh, your different needs, maybe you go hiking pretty often or something like that, will have different priorities in their pet first aid kit, if that makes sense. Like you might wanna have more saline for flushing a wound versus like a tiny bottle for, for if you have a iguana or something like that. So, Important things are slip leashes. So um, slip leashes, sorry, that's the one thing I forgot. I'll be right back. Good thing my house is small. So this is a slip leash. We are using lots of these right now at Dove Lewis. All the time we do, but extra slip leashes. So they slip on and off, right? And these are great for pets that get out of their collars or harnesses, or you find a stray pet in the street, a lost pet. Um, they slip over their head pretty easily because of course the last thing a pet wants is you to go grabbing and reaching for them, which could cause them to run away or cause you, you know, they're scared. So you could cause, cause you to get bitten. Um, so slipping them over your head um, or over their head, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and you know that way they are they're in a um, secure hold they might pull back people ask me if they would choke themselves and you know what if they're gonna pull as hard as they can but at least they're not getting away and like running into the street or something like that so a slip leash is always a good thing to have um you never know what's going to happen to your leash or your collar too um because you know pets chew things and things get ruined so um towels uh and or washcloths or clean rags whatever have a bunch of those i have a a few <laughs> in my car and of course we have extra ones in our house and things like that towels are great for cleaning things of course they're great for picking up um, smaller scared or injured pets um, wrapping our smaller pets I have a small dog you'll see some pictures of her later um, and if she was injured somehow and in pain she, I have no doubt that she would try and bite me because that's what they do when they're in pain right um, and a towel would be a good barrier for us also a good way to you know keep them contained. Um, so having plenty of those around uh, is great. Non-stick bandages. So this is a non-stick bandage. You can find all of these things, and they might be called something else, but you can you know um, ask the people at the store, like at Walgreens or Rite Aid or any of those things. Amazon, you know, all those kinds of stuff. Um, 
and a non-stick bandage is great because it has this nice little shiny film over it. I don't know, my picture's tiny, but um, I'm explaining it. So it's got cotton on the inside and then it has a nice little film over it and it has little tiny holes in it. So it is breathable, but it's not gonna stick to their wound. So if you have a wound and you put like cotton balls or gauze on it, it'll stick to their wound. And then you have to, you know, when it has to get cleaned and taken off, then it'll stick to it. So nice um, non-stick bandages are great gauze or cotton balls. So like just literally cotton balls or gauze are great for cleaning. Um, you know, and cotton balls are soft. So you can use those around the eyes. You can use those for tiny places, those kinds of things. Make sure you have some gloves on hand. Um, so I have a couple little baggies with like a pair of glove, gloves each. Um, here we go like that. And they're labeled in sizes because my husband's hands are a lot bigger than mine. So, <laughs> um, you know, you just want to, keep things clean and it's not necessarily like um, that you're worried about contaminating. You, that's, that's what you're worried about with gloves. So you wanna make sure you're not contaminating their wounds. Um, and then water-based lubricant. So I have a couple things here. I have a tiny little package of water-based lube and this means that it's sterile because it's contained and you can't, once it's open, then I can't use it more than once, right? Um, but I also have a bottle, which is great for taking temperature. Um, I probably wouldn't use this one for eyes, maybe this tiny one, keep one separate for wounds and one for eyes. But um, you wanna make sure that it is water-based because if you are using this for putting on eyes or um, using on wounds, um, you don't wanna add anything else other than water into there. Um, and the reason, I'll show you some pictures and a few more slides that you um, can use this on wounds is to help keep it nice and moist and fresh so that those wounds can be closed, hopefully. Um, saline solution, you don't necessarily have to go buy a bottle of saline, you could use bottled water. So just stick a bottle of water or some kind of container with clean water in your first aid kit. Um, they make teeny tiny bottles of Dawn dish soap or you could put it in another container, but Dawn dish soap really is as wonderful and gentle as they say. Uh, we use it on ducklings that have grease on them. Um, we used it on some sticky stuff on this dove that came in the other day, it, it's really gentle. Um, and then, like I was talking about earlier, when pets are injured, they can bite because they don't understand what's going on and it causes pain, right? So a muzzle is a good thing to have. It's always nice to have one in your pet's size. Um, and if you don't have a muzzle, then you can have some brown gauze, um, which could also be used for bandaging, but this is just the gauze that I have. They have it in white too. It's just very thin gauze. Um, and I have some pictures of how to make a muzzle out of this very quickly say you come across a stray dog that was hit by a car, this would help protect you as well as, you know, a towel and some blankets and things like that. So we'll see a picture in a couple of slides. Um, bandage material, basically gauze, your non-adherent pad. Um, we call it vet wrap, but I heard it's Coban in <laughs> human medicine. Um, and then other kinds of gauze, which is like cotton gauze. So this stuff pulls apart really easily. It's just very soft and thin. That's great for bandaging. And then a pet information card, which are put together and will be emailed to you guys later. Um, the pet information card is great. It has places for you to fill out, fill out your pet's information. You know, what's your pet's name? How old are they? Are they spayed or neutered? Um, what's your regular veterinarian's name? And what's their phone number and contacts and um, making sure that you have a list. When you go and get vaccines done, you can get a printout of those vaccines and when they were given and when they're due again. And that is great because making sure that you stay up to date on your rabies vaccines is very important, obviously, but also that could be the difference if your pet has been vaccinated for lepto, then maybe we don't have to follow that lepto protocol, say if you came in, um, or as it might not be a high, high diagnosis, differential diagnosis, um, if your pet has been vaccinated for lepto and they come in with horrible kidney injury or something like that. So that's very vague, but that's a good day. Um, pet photos, if something were to happen to one of our phones and we don't have all the photos on there, it's really great to have some printed out because you never know if you're going to need to post them somewhere or show somebody or anything like that. Um, and important contact numbers. This pet information card and having all these things together beforehand is really important because when you, when something dramatic happens, when something stressful happens. Everything out of our mind goes out of our mind. And it happens to me too. I, I deal with high stress situations pretty often at Dub Lewis, but when something happens to my dog, Josie, I can't remember when I gave her her pain medication last or anything. So having it all written down is really great. Okay, on to our next slide. Additional items that may be helpful. Um, 
triple antibiotic ointment. Just make sure that your pets don't lick that off too much. A little bit is okay. It's not going to harm them. But if you apply it every five minutes and they're licking it off, then that could cause some GI upset. Antiseptic wipes, if you'd like to. Again, be careful with them licking that stuff. Scissors and clippers for cleaning you know, hair away from wounds. Um, be very careful with scissors. Very careful. I will admit that I have nicked my dog Josie back when I first started giving her haircuts, which was a very long time ago. But um, and it happens all the time. You know, you can't see in their hair and in their mats and or they move and something happens. So we see a lot of like scissor injuries. Um, so clippers are great because they have a little blade protector on them and things like that. Um, tweezers, be careful with tweezers too. If you want to keep this stuff in there, that's fine. Um, a pen light, so they, or like a flashlight, but pen lights are smaller, so it's kind of nice um, to be able to see maybe up underneath, um, you know, your large dog or in a small area, things like that. Digital thermometer, literally like a regular thermometer that we would use for under our tongue, um, like this. Uh, you're going to be using this rectally, and we will show you some pictures later and the normals on the temperature and things like that. But make sure you know, use it for just your pet's first aid kit. Um, you can take thermometer temperatures um, under their armpits and they have some for their ears, but they are not as accurate as a rectal, as a rectal temperature um, for pets. So um, t-shirts and socks are always great to have around because if you get a laceration on their side or something like that, then a t-shirt over them will help protect that a little bit and keep them from licking it too much while you're coming into the um, either your day practice or to the emergency vet clinic. Um, if you'd like to have other things like betadine solution, that's fine. Betadine solution over any kind of other cleaner, except for saline, around their face, eyes, ears, mouth, all that kind of thing. All the, you know, um, anything around their head is better than any kind of soap or anything like that. Dawn might be okay because it's pretty gentle. Um, you can use an eyedropper or a syringe for cleaning. And then here is the, um, here are the items for like non-stick or for bandage material. Um, I usually, demo this with one of our wonderful pack dogs, um, but I'm not gonna be able to do that today. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join me at one of my live ones uh, soon. <laughs> um, the, so the tongue depressor is not necessary, um, neither is the, uh, the tape. And a sock is great because you can make a very quick bandage out of it. I, might, I would never be able to bandage my dog's foot, ever. Um, so I don't even know if I'd be able to get a sock on her. I think I'd just have to wrap her up in a towel and take her in. Um, so being prepared. So you will have your pet first aid kit, um, your pet information card in your pet first aid kit. I recommend keeping one in um, your pet first aid kit and then also in your car because you never know if you're going to, uh, if you're going to be at home and to grab that pet first aid kit or if you're just gonna be in your car. Make sure that you're going somewhere or the, this is kind of um, a list of things to have for like a general disaster or a natural disaster or something like that. Um, collar with ID tags. Um, I know our cats don't usually wear a whole lot of collars that are indoor cats, but make sure that you have collars so that if you leave the house, those go on your cat because if your cat gets out or if your dog gets loose or something like that, at least we have some kind of ID. Hopefully they're all microchipped too, um, but collars are great too. Um, extras, blankets and towels, you'll make sure you want to have some water. Um, so this is rough, rough idea of how much water you would need. So two cups per 10 pounds. Um, of your pet's weight uh, per day. Obviously, if it's warmer, you'll need some more water than that, um, and then so on and so forth. Um, leash harness crate. I have a crate that I've uh, carried around for a very, very long time, and I've only had to utilize it once, <laughs> so um, that's good, but make sure you have a crate just in case. Um, also, pet waste bags, litter boxes, of course, um, rescue stickers. Those are at the, that's the top picture um, on this PowerPoint slide. Um, we have some ones with our new logo on it and feel free to get some of those from Dub Lewis and stick those on your windows of your apartment or your house. Um, and then evacuation drills, make sure you have a plan slash meeting place with your loved ones um, or friends or family. Um, and when you're going somewhere, say you're going to Mount Hood to go for a hike, make sure that you let somebody know when you're going to be back. And that is how we go hiking now with Josie. That's Josie in our backpack. <laughs> All right, so first off, we wanna start with knowing our normals. And this is very important for you because you know your pets better than anybody else. So we start with observation. I want you all to this afternoon and <laughs> throughout the day, um, observe your pet, because this is when in their normal situation, their normal setting, they will have their normal vitals, right? Uh, so observing them, 
Um, you're going to learn how to do a basic physical exam, and that means you know also taking in vital signs. So, um, and then we'll go over those in the next couple of slides. So recognizing signs of pain. Um, this can be a little difficult with our different sized um, pets. So usually pain is um, correlated with, or our heart rate is um, elevated in regard with pain seen. There we go. Um, and respirations are usually elevated as well. Not always. Sometimes they are just nervous and so their heart rate is up and they're panting in, you know, in a hospital or in a weird setting or something like that. Um, but body confirmation and posture is very important too. But we want to take into account everything that's going on, right? So we can see on the left-hand side our lovely boxer who's kind of in this downward dog position. And if he was outside playing doing this kind of stance, then I would think, great, that's a boxer. He's just playing. He's like getting down and he wants you to throw the ball or something like that. Here, he's stretching his abdomen out. He's not shaking his tail. He's not letting us know that he's excited or anything like that. He's stretching his abdomen because his tummy hurts. So taking into consideration all the things that are going on. This little chihuahua, <laughs> this one's hard too, uh, because sometimes little dogs just shake, right? Sometimes something's different and they're just shaking because they're nervous or maybe they did something naughty or, you know, like Josie will shake when I find a pile of pee, it's great. Um, but sometimes it's because of pain too. So you kind of have to take and, and rule out other reasons. And kitties can be really hard to tell when they're painful sometimes. Sometimes they're very vocal about it. Um, sometimes they're not eating, you know, and that's where you know your pet the best and you'll know when they're off. Um, but usually they have a like a grimace and they will crouch down kind of like this kitty over in the right hand corner and his ears are kind of back and his eyes are not dilated so we can tell that he's either saying go away from me or, or I'm uncomfortable. Vital signs, so MM and CRT is mucous membranes and capillary refill time. So our mucous membranes are our lovely pink, well, we'll, talk, we'll start with the uh, upper uh, picture. That is supposed to be a nice pink color. So you guys are gonna all go and look at your pet's gum color and it should be pink. Now, the variations of pink, you will read like nice bubblegum pink. Cats don't usually have a nice bubblegum pink. They're usually about the color of this dog. Um, a light, light pink. So is my dog's, her, her gum colors are nice pink too. However, we wanna be watching for like bright red gums or white gums or blue or purple for sure. Um, so, you know, a nice healthy pink and give it a second. Sometimes when you lift up their gum, it takes a second for the blood to come back and be like a normal, their normal color. Um, so great, we know that our lovely um, upper picture stuff. <laughs> the dog in the upper picture is a nice pink. The one below it is pretty white. Um, and I'm not talking about the like um, variation of the little black spots. That's just because of the dog's coloring. Um, but he's pretty pale. And that can be a sign of shock. That can be a sign of blood loss, those kinds of things. The one on the bottom to the right is, yes, we're, we're pink and bubblegum. But if you see those little pinpoints of like blood drops in there, that is petechiation. I don't expect you to remember that, but but that is not normal and that could be um, a sign of like a bleeding disorder. So that would be important. Or you might even see this dog have like blood like oozing around the gums, around the teeth. So that's something else to be aware of. So, you know, like go ahead and look at your pet's normal gum color and then that's what you know to go off of. Take into consideration what they've been doing. If they've been sleeping, <laughs> blood is not pumping like it normally would. If they stand up, like right away and then you look at their gum color, it might be a little pale because you know they just woke up and blood needs to start getting circulated normally again. Or if they're running around outside and they come in and they're hot, it could be pretty red and that's that could be normal. You know, take a, take a look in another 20 minutes or so and see if it's back to normal. So capillary refill time, what we do there is we pick up their gum, you see what color it is, and then you push on their gum for very quickly. It's kind of just a just like that. And you see the blood should go away from it. So it should you know, have like no color slash almost pale pink or white, and then see how long it takes for that blood to come back to that spot. So it should be about two seconds, one to two seconds, pretty quick. If it takes longer than that, like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, then, you know, do it a couple of times and see what's going on, but it could be just a, a perfusion um, issue. So, all right, heart rate. So, um, Dogs' heart rates can be between 80 and 140, and cats can be 140 to 200. This also varies on size of pet. So um, 
our bigger dogs tend to have our, our lower heart rates and these are resting heart rates. These are like, I'm just chilling out, hanging out at home. I have not come in from a run. I didn't just sprint around the house or something like that because then their heart rate would be higher, right? Um, so our um, bigger dogs tend to have lower heart rates. So it's not unusual to see a Great Dane who's you know snoozing on the floor to have a heart rate of 60 or 40 or 80 if he's sleeping. If he's up and moving around and just running around then he could have a heart rate of 100, 120. Um, Josie, my small dog, tends her heart rate can be as low as 90 when she's sleeping. So I'm not concerned about that. So, you know, get an idea of what your pet's heart rate is. If you have a hard time finding their heart rate, because if you don't have a stethoscope, um, it might be harder to feel pulses. Things like that on our smaller pets. I'm a little nervous at the vet, so you'd have to take that into consideration too. It's not unusual for us to have cats come in with a heart rate of 200 at 220 uh, normally because they're nervous. So fine dogs. Um, it is harder to feel femoral pulses or like in this dog picture, we're feeling the inside of their back leg. So their inner thigh, their femoral pulse in there. Um, and it's about midway between kind of their groin area and their knee, um, maybe higher up than a little bit higher up than midway. Um, and you want to, do a nice amount of pressure, but not too hard, or else you could occlude that vessel and not be able to feel the pulse very well. But if you have a larger dog, that would be a good place to feel pulses. Um, if you have a stethoscope, listening around kind of the, um, close to their sternum, but on either side of their chest is good because their chest, their heart is pretty centered. I hope that helps. Um, you can also ask your veterinarian to show you, or maybe you'll be able to come to one of the, the live first aid um, trainings in a little while. Vital signs, okay, respiratory rate and effort. So cats tend to have, dogs cat, dogs and cats, 12 to 36 breaths per minute. Um, so you would count your breaths, you know, you could do um, 10 seconds and multiply that by um, 60, or six, sorry. Um, so for 60 seconds, you'll be counting. Um, and, you know, notice they breathe differently when they're sleeping, their breath, their respiratory rate will be probably lower, it might be 10 breaths per minute when they're sleeping. Um, and panting is just panting, it's okay, you don't have to count pants. Um, this kitty here is breathing harder. I hope you can see the, the um, picture of this cat breathing. She is uh, just, just a step away from panting and it is not good when our kitties pant. Um, that usually is a sign of uh, respiratory distress. Um, it can be just stress related sometimes. Sometimes panting will come and go. It's, so you have to take a look at the whole picture when that's happening. But this kid is doing more abdominal breathing. If you can see our abdomen, we had a little shave spot because we had some fluid in our chest that we had to take. So we took out and we're breathing a little bit better than we, um, are, we did when we first came in. Um, so it should just be a normal expansion uh, and um, expansion of the chest and you know not a whole lot of effort for a normal breath. When we start having more effort with our abdomen, um, that could be an issue. All right, and here's a dog who's um, really tired, breathing hard. We've got some oxygen in front of his nose and um, it's kind of hard to see this picture, the camera's moving, but we're doing some abdominal breathing here as well. Here's the next one. There we go. All right, temperature. So pets' temperatures are a lot higher than ours. Um, so you're going to insert that rectally. It's nice, again, to use lubricant on that. Um, and their temperature is 100 to 1025. So you can try and take this on your own. Um, be careful, you might need a, you know, a friend to help you just because they're, it's, it's an odd thing. Some pets are better, are okay, better, more okay with it than others. There we go. I can't take my dog's temperature at home. <laughs> so, um, and if your cat, if your cat lets you take your temperature, then I don't know. <laughs> um, so their temp is 100 to 102.5. It may vary a little bit. Josie's is about 99.5. She wears a sweater pretty much all the time, except for the summer. Um, if you have a husky and they're hanging out on the floor, they would be probably a little bit normal. But if they've been standing out in the sun, it might not be abnormal for them to be 1028 and then you know you recheck it in a little while but this is where they usually run right do we have so if something is wrong if you see that one of their vital signs is off or you get you're just something's not right what's next or maybe it's something big 
it's very important to remain calm because we can't help our pets unless we're safe too. So it's important to assess the situation. Take into consideration, are they breathing? Do they have a pulse? Great. Then basic physical exam. If something's off, but their vitals are normal, okay, we can, we can hang out a little bit. Maybe we can call our RDVM, our regular vet, and, and talk to them about what's been going on. They're just off. Um, it's important to minimize the injury and respond. So, you know, if you see a pet that's been hit by a car, make sure that you, you know, obviously look both ways before you cross the street, but it's very important to take a deep breath before you do that because our bodies just kind of go into overdrive and then we, we need to make sure that we stay safe. Um, so make sure that you have something with you to, if it is some kind of injury to give yourself some protection, but also maybe like to um, cushion picking up or helping to move your pet. Um, and then does this need veterinary care? This can be difficult. I would say that everything that has some kind of trauma involved should definitely be evaluated by a veterinarian. You never know what could be happening. And our bodies go into compensatory shock. So we have pets who get hit by a car and they're doing fine. And then an hour later, they are not doing fine. And it is best to have them looked at and, and helped and in the hospital or in a hospital before, before that compensatory shock kind of starts to wear off. Um, so it's hard to say, but it's always, it's always an option to call um, either your regular veterinarian or you can call Dove Lewis um, just to get an idea if you should go in. We have um, technicians that take tech calls 24 hours a day. So assess the situation. Is it safe? Are they conscious? If they're not conscious, be very careful moving them because if they come to and you are in the middle of moving them or picking them up, they are going to be very scared or painful or something like that and you want to make sure that you are safe. So how do I approach the animal? I would say slowly because you can startle them as, as you know. Um, and so here are some things to help keep you safe. So we have our um, lovely piece of gauze that is making a muzzle for this lovely golden on the table. At the, those are the top three pictures. Basically, it's just kind of a makeshift muzzle. They tied one little loop knot type thing around their nose and went by, back behind their head. That is not going to stop this golden from biting if they did try to, but it would lessen the ability of, for her or him to open um, their mouth as wide. So it's just a little extra safety for us because you know moving pets that are in pain or scared um, can be dangerous. Um, this little uh, King Charles down in the bottom left corner, um, we're using like a folded over towel as like a kind of like a donut collar. Um, just you know now this dog can't turn around as much, which is which is easier to control a little bit. Um, and then I love this cat picture with the placemat. Um, somebody at home, this cat was chewing on himself and got around. You can see barely that there's an e-collar or an Elizabethan collar, one of those cone collars sticking out underneath this placemat. And he was able to get around that. You know, these guys are Houdinis. <laughs> um, so they used a placemat at home and uh, made an e-collar and brought the cat in. <laughs> um, and then this cat in the blue towel, we call that a kitty burrito. And, um, you know, cats do a good job of like just do they call it loafing? <laughs> kind of crunching down and pulling in their limbs um, and putting them and wrapping them in a towel is a great way to transport them and a better way to hold on to them. I could also do this with Josie. She might not want to lay down though. Um, wildlife, um, towels and boxes are great. Be careful if it's, a you know, be careful not to get bitten. Um, Birds breathe by expanding their chest. So if you are going to transport a bird, a wildlife bird or something like that, be careful not to put too much pressure on their thorax or they actually don't just have a thorax and an abdomen. It's one, one cavity, uh, but be careful to not hold them too tightly. Um, and then raptors or owls, things like that. Be careful, be very careful with their um, talons. So many towels is great. Um, immediate care of bleeding. So when to visit the vet? That can be a hard thing to um, determine, especially over the phone too. <clears throat> so yeah, bleeding, when to go to the vet would be depending on the, the wound. If it's a toenail that you nick too short, it's okay. If you're able to get it to stop bleeding, then great. Um, if they don't leave it alone though, and they continue to lick at it, it could cause some kind of um, you know, possible like infection eventually because it's, you know, their mouth is, you know, kind of a dirty place. The hard part is, is when 
they have trauma or you don't know if they're bleeding internally versus externally. So keeping an eye on their gum color, keeping an eye on their abdomen, are they distended? Are they painful? Those kinds of things. Um, if in doubt, it's best to have them looked at. Um, you can apply direct pressure if they will allow you. Um, you can try and elevate. That is That can be difficult, right? <laughs> so, you know, trying to direct, uh, apply direct pressure. I would say start with 10 minutes and don't peek. So if you have gauze or a towel or a washcloth and your pet will let you hold direct pressure on that site of you know bleeding for 10 minutes great and then after that you know you can you can start to look and see how that's going um but if they're obviously if they have a extensive wound or you can see part of a puncture or something like that it's important to have them seen because we will often find like a dog bite wound um you see one little puncture here and as we start cleaning and clipping and shaving after of course they have pain medication on board it's um you'd be surprised how many times that we find other wounds because obviously teeth are um, teeth go in at different areas. So, um, and I have tourniquets on here because tourniquets can be very dangerous. We don't use tourniquets very often in the hospital because they can cut off circulation and cause tissue damage. And then you could lose a limb or tail or something like that. Right. So we set a timer and we are very, very careful about that. So I would not recommend a tourniquet. I would recommend, um, I can't recommend a tourniquet actually. And I would recommend just trying to apply pressure and coming into a hospital. If you're having to apply a tourniquet, definitely needs to be seen. So immediate care, wound care, stay safe. Again, I can't tell you how important that is. It, I, I repeat this over and over because when you bring your pet into the hospital and if you have become bitten, then you need to now go to urgent care and it will be harder for you to be treated obviously because you're worried about your pet, but also we'll have to get a hold of you and and you need to go to urgent care as well. So bleeding, try and apply pressure. This upper picture of this, this is a Labrador with a horrible um, wound. Um, that was from a, I think it was like a lawnmower or something like that. And look at how nice and red and you can see it kind of, kind of moist. We put, that dog came in, got a great dose of pain medication and we put um, water-based lubricant in that. And that tissue is really healthy and we were able to close all of that, which is really great, right? So I would not be able to apply, I'm sure you would not be able to apply pressure to this and that's okay, let's just get this dog into the hospital. And then now we were, you know, anesthetized and able to do a wonderful laceration repair. Um, the one below it is an iguana and he fell between, um, I think he fell down a recliner and had a, had a wound. Um, we were able to suture that up um, very carefully and he's doing fine. And then the one, we're gonna skip the bandage one, but over to the left and the bottom is a um, greyhound. And that is a degloving injury. So those happen when like the pet gets drugged or hit by a car or something like that. And basically it slides the foot on something abrasive, usually asphalt or something. And it just degloves it and we can't close that because there's no tissue to close. Um, so we do wet to dry bandages and this is going to need a long-term long -term bandage changes and care and, and close um, attention um, to make sure that it's healing well. Um, and then the other one is a bandage there. So making sure that you come in so that we can do proper bandaging. Notice how we have bandaged all the way down and covered the toes in this too. So when I talked about applying bandages properly, you wanna make sure that even if you have a wound, like say around their elbow or midway between their, their toes and their elbow, <laughs> you have to bandage all the way down to their toes. So if you are going to be a single on that hood and something happens and you, are, you have a long hike back down before you come into the hospital, which you have to do if you're bandaged, um, make sure that you cover all the way down because you wanna have that even amount of pressure all the way down. Because if you stop it at their wrist area, that, um, everything that's flowing, lymph, blood, all that kind of stuff is going to not be able to um, have the same amount of pressure. So it's going to make their toes swell. And it could even cut off circulation. So, so bleeding, rinse clean. You can use just water, no scrubbing. You don't want to create extra bleeding there. You don't want to irritate the skin or tissues more than, more than they already are. Um, if you can't, get all the debris out with just a simple rinse. And even our pets might not let us rinse a wound, right? That lab was probably in a lot of pain. Um, then don't do it. Um, so no scrubbing. Lubricant if you have it. If not, just come on into the hospital. We'll do it when you get here or your regular vet. Um, 
And then I usually go over bandaging, um, but I can't do that today. Josie would definitely never let me do that. Um, and I wanted to say one more thing. Um, if there is a um, impaling or any kind of like a stick or anything sticking into them, leave it. If you can stabilize it, great. Don't pull it out because you don't know what that is occluding that could start bleeding or, or possibly open their uh, thorax or abdomen to the outside world. Is it broken? So painful, be very careful. These are some options that you can do to stabilize things if your pet will let you. If not, just come on in. So I love this one with um, this dog that's on plywood with straps and a, and a tarp and things like that. This dog was down in the hind end and his owner thought that he maybe had a broken hind leg or something like that. So we pulled this wonderful plywood out of the truck and put it on our um, gurney and brought him in and lowered him to the ground and then undid the um, ratchet straps and the dog got up and walked. But that was a great way to stabilize this pet had he really been, um, had a broken hind leg or injured or something like that. Um, so this one, the uh, newspaper is great because you are not going to, you can't really do that too tightly if you're doing a full thing in newspaper, but it really does stabilize that leg. And I've seen, I saw a break a couple of days ago that was really bad and this would have been nice because then it's not flopping. However, please do not try and do these things if your pet is, is so painful that they won't allow that to happen safely. It's more important just to get them in and get some pain meds versus trying to do this at home. Um, a towel is another option. It's just a nice soft way to stabilize it. You don't even have to tape it. You could just slide it underneath their leg while you ride into the hospital. Um, so cats need to be contained. Please, please have a carrier. And if you don't let us, let us or your RDVM know, your regular vet, sorry, um, that you don't have a carrier because uh, we don't want your pets to get loose in the parking lot or get away from you. Um, so even a pillowcase, worst case scenario, boxes are great, things like that. Dogs on blankets, if they're if they're really injured or down and you have the ability to put a big blanket or something underneath them in the back seat or wherever they're going to be laying, it's so much easier to pull them out on a blanket or a towel versus trying to pick them up and move them if they're really injured. And I'm talking about like hit by cars, things like that. Um, towels and muzzles is needed. Um, keep them warm. It doesn't mean you need to blast the heat, just, you know, warm. If you have a blanket, great. And then make sure that you drive safe because we need you to be able to get them in so that we can help or, or your regular vet can help. Um, so common emergencies, trauma, dog bite wounds, obviously this dog, like I was talking about earlier, that big laceration that's closer to the table. We knew about that one. We didn't know about the other two up on this dog's neck. Now this is over that dog's trachea, right? Around that area slash jugulars in there too. Um, we needed to make sure that those were not, um, communicating with anything underneath or pocketing because, you know, dog's teeth are longer and they can go in and kind of hook. So this dog was lucky and we didn't have to put a drain in or anything like that, but we, we didn't know and nobody knew until we started clipping and cleaning that they had more wounds. So dogs got good pain meds on board and we're going to do a clip and clean and figure out how to bandage this because I don't think an e-collar would be great for that spot. Um, torn toenails. Um, so never cut beyond the pink. It's hard when you have black toenails, um, you know, so little bits at a time. If you do nick them, which it happens, you know, like they move, they don't like their toenails trimmed. Um, if you have quick stop, that's good. It can sting a little bit, but that really is like the best thing to make bleeding stop. Cornstarch is another option. I've heard flour or a bar of soap because you just kind of stick the bar of soap or what I've heard um, on their toe and that way it kind of creates a little cap. You also want to keep them off of that though because if it is bleeding a lot and they are walking around, it'll just take that scab away. Bandage, maybe, if you can put a sock on it. Then again, if the sock touches that area where you're trying to get the bleeding to stop, it might just take that scab away again. Keep your pet quiet and try the, to keep them from licking, um, you know, clean and dry. Um, and it's okay if you have a torn toenail or quick toenail that you need to bring in to, the, to your RDVM or to an emergency clinic. Sometimes it's very hard to do this at home um, by yourself. You know, when they're injured, that's just not a pleasant thing. Um, common emergencies. So any respiratory difficulty is an emergency. Um, make sure you check your, their weight, rate and effort. If they're coughing, that could be, you know, um, signs of heart disease, pneumonia, those kinds of things. If it's one or two coughs, don't worry about it. But if it's happening more and more frequently or they're going into coughing fits, then, you know, it might be something um, that should be looked at. Again, you can always call or just come on in. It's better to be safe than sorry. Um, so 
res, our URI is upper respiratory infection. Our kitties get upper respiratory infections, um, uh, especially kittens for sure, uh, pretty often. Um, pneumonia, it could be cardiac disease, coughing can, can be a sign of cardiac disease sometimes. Um, collapsing trachea in our um, different breeds and then laryngeal paralysis, usually in our lar larger dogs. Um, I would look up and watch a few videos on the difference between collapsing trachea and reverse sneezing. Usually both of those can get, um, you know, you either have to like ignore your pet or distract them or calm them down. And then those that usually stops that kind of reverse sneezing or collapsing trachea episode. Um, and reverse sneezing isn't usually an emergency unless they really can't um, snap out of it for lack of a better term. Um, but collapsing trachea can be because it becomes this kind of vicious cycle, not always, but it can be because it, it causes, it can cause irritation and then they're having trouble breathing and that kind of thing. So it can go into a little, little bit of a um, snowball. GI upsets, GI issues, um, foreign bodies. If you know that your pet ate something, depending on what it is, you know, we can, or your regular vet can induce vomiting and then great, maybe we just saved this, uh, like this golden who ate that shark from a foreign body surgery. This might be on the verge of something that we might not want to induce vomiting on because that's a pretty good size toy for that dog to have swallowed. So what if it gets stuck in their esophagus? So your veterinarian will talk to you about whether this is a safe option or not for um, inducing vomiting. Um, but yeah, those kinds of things. So salmon poisoning, that's another thing that we're coming into. Um, so salmon poisoning, to put it shortly, it's um, salmon and trout, and it's this bacterial, lovely giant life cycle that happens. But basically, there's bacteria that gets into a snail, and then it goes back out of the snail, and then into fish, <laughs> and then your fish. It's a, a it's a um, rickettsial uh, like bacterial disease. So, and then your your dog usually <clears throat> um, will either lick or eat part of a usually dead. Uh, salmon or trout and then they don't usually they don't show signs for about seven to ten days um, so some veterinarians will treat um, ahead of time and maybe they will prescribe antibiotics we wouldn't do that because they might not get sick from it you know that the, not all fish are carrying this rickettsial disease but um, but knowing that your 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 dog licked a fish or ate part of a fish a couple you know, weeks ago, a week ago, um, is good because we can, you know, look at a fecal sample, see that lovely little guy floating around in that fecal sample, and then we would give, um, uh, you know, supportive therapy because this can cause them to be very dehydrated and um, cause liver issues, um, so on and so forth. Just something to be aware of. HGE is an acronym. We love our acronyms in the veterinary field, medical field, I should say. Um, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, and that's very broad. It basically just means that your pet has um, vomiting or diarrhea that has some blood in it. Um, so that, that's that, that hemorrhage, hemorrhage, hemorrhagic. <clears throat> um, excuse me for some water. Um, so that needs supportive therapy. And if there's a reason of why that's happening, then obviously hopefully we'll get to the bottom of that and be able to correct it. But it's, you know, the GI system gets irritated if vomiting and diarrhea goes on for too long, and then you can see signs of blood, um, and et cetera. So anything that, you know, your pet has eaten. Um, so common emergencies, toxins. There are so many medications out there. There are a lot of newer um, or human-specific medications that if we get phone calls, and I can't even think of some of them right now. I had one the other day where we're like, I, we don't know what that medication is. You really do have to call ASPCA animal poison control because they will know if this is, and the, the amount that your pet possibly ate and the size of your pet, if this is toxic or not. And if it needs treatment, then they will let you know. And then we will already have a treatment plan from ASPCA. So the reason that there's costs on here is because basically what happens is you or your veterinarian calls them, but then your veterinarian has to charge you this fee too and their, you know, their time. So um, you call them before you come in and tell them what happened and they'll tell you if you need to come in or not. And then they'll also give you a case number. Um, and then that case number will kind of be like, so the vet will now call ASPCA or pet poison and have that treatment plan all ready to go. Um, this kid down at the bottom, I don't know if you saw him squirming around or not. He ate, uh, I think it was a like a, 
chocolate chip cookie with marijuana in it. And so he's not laterally recumbent or laying on his side, but he is very, um, he's very out of it. He's very, he's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, Saturday and not enough coffee yet, I guess. Um, unsteady. Uh, so ataxic, there we go. So he's, you know, teetering around. He's, he can't seem to find his center, but he's, um, he's got that chocolate in there to give him a little bit of caffeine. So he got some charcoal and some soggy fluids. And um, if he was not able to stand like this, we would have probably asked to hospitalize him, but he did okay. Um, common emergencies toxins. So these are things that we don't, uh, not everybody knows about. So that's why I put these on here. Um, we have in that Tomcat bucket, that lovely bucket with the green stuff next to it, rat bait. Does everybody, well, I guess I'll just tell you because then I can't really see your faces. Um, rat bait, there's two types of rat bait. One is a neuro kind of thing, but the rat bait that we're more familiar with is um, an anticoagulant. So it basically causes the rats or mice that eat it to not be able to clot, with their clotting factors to just not be existent. Um, so it will cause pets to bleed out. So it's very important that we like know what kind they ate. So make sure if you have the container, bring the container in because if some of them, if we induce vomiting inside, um, it can cause very bad toxic gases. So we might have to do that outside or some of them we might not even want to induce vomiting. We'll just have to do some other treatments. Um, albuterol, um, some dogs will or cats will chew on albuterol that is very important to get them into the hospital um, it can cause like electrolyte imbalances and and uh just a lot of things i won't scare you with um i have the peanut butter down here this nuts and more not normal peanut butter this is like the high protein peanut butter so they add xylitol to it they also add xylitol to can add xylitol or some kind of artificial sweetener to um like natural toothpaste. This Mavericks, I think, has has xylitol in it. Um, Orbit, some gums. A lot of gums have um, xylitol in it. And xylitol causes pets to have low blood sugar, but it can also cause liver injury. So basically, it's just like a roller coaster for their, their um, blood sugar values. Um, lilies are very toxic to cats, all parts of them. They don't, they could, you know, just chew on the leaf or the get some pollen on their face and I'll see you'll see some pictures in a couple of slides I think it's actually the next one um, of lilies so lilies basically cause crystallization of the kidneys in cats um, so it's very important if you know that they've eaten lilies to have the, to bring them in diuresis they need fluids they need to have their kidney values monitored they might need some binding agents given to them those kinds of things um, and then our human uh, pain medications, uh, acetaminophen can cause uh, red blood cell damage, liver damage, those kinds of things. Ibuprofen can cause GI ulcers, um, liver damage again. So I know that there are some doses and we don't, we don't um, prescribe Advil or um, acetaminophen or ibuprofen just because we have other, other pet specific pain medications. So I can't recommend giving any of these and I wouldn't even know what doses because we just, it's not safe. Um, grapes and raisins, uh, uh, the hard part about this is that, so they can cause um, kidney damage as well. And we don't know if it's grapes or raisins or which ones, and some dogs or cats, mostly cat dogs, sorry, might be more susceptible to it. So if you know that they ate them, inducing vomiting is the best thing, maybe some diuresis, it, it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, you know, sometimes we don't see any elevations in renal values, but I have a coworker whose dog got into trail mix and we saw some um, high renal values. So better to be safe than sorry. Always call too. So here again, chocolate is the theobromine in it. So it's the, it's the um, kind of caffeine. So yes, some, it, it's hard to know where, how much chocolate and how dark or whatnot is going to be something that causes your, like causes issues for your pet. It could be just GI upset or it could be like, their heart rate is so high and now they're exhausted and they're having arrhythmias. So um, you can call a veterinary clinic and they can do some calculations and things like that. Um, or a Great Dane may be able to have a bunch of Hershey's Kisses, uh, but my dog would not be able to handle very many Hershey's Kisses, even just the milk chocolate ones. Um, so it's it's a size and how much and how, how dark the chocolate, that kind of thing. So marijuana, THC, that gets recycled through their... Um, their liver system, so their kidney system, and and it just takes a lot longer for them to to process that out. Um, we worry about them getting cold. They'll have low blood pressure. 
um, low heart rate, if they are not like that dog was sitting, trying to sit up in his kennel, if they're not trying to do anything or move around, if they have had ingested that much, um, we worry about risk of them like regurgitating and, or vomiting and aspirating. So that's where it's very worrisome. And they could be like that for a long time. So getting some treatment for them is very important. Um, again, xylitol we talked about, or we talked about, grapes and raisins. Um, the last thing I want to say, so the lilies, this is a, <laughs> of course it's a white cat. Um, this cat was the sweetest thing. She um, had pollen from lilies all over her face. She was very guilty, all over her paws. So she had the yellow all over her face and paws. So we gave her a bath because we were like, you can't have any more of that. We tried to induce vomiting, which is difficult on cats. Um, and then we gave subcu fluids and activated charcoal to help kind of bind that and you know, they followed up with, um, with um, blood work to make sure that things were okay and that we didn't need more treatments. Um, so of course I had to give her activated charcoal and she took it very well, but then we had a little bit of gray left on her face. Um, pyrethrins. Pyrethrins can cause cats to have seizures. Um, and pyrethrins, sometimes pyrethrins are in dog flea product. So it is very important to get a cat specific flea product. Be very careful when you're putting flea products on cats um, because it's absorbed through. If it's a topical one, it's absorbed through their oils and their skin. So once you have a pyrethrin um, uh, flea product on there, we bathe them, but it's hard to get all of that off. And then your pet can have seizures. It's, it's just better to be safe than sorry with cat flea product. So GDV, um, another acronym, is gastric dilation volvulus. So this is bloat. You can see that this um, standard poodle has kind of a pretty good size abdomen, mostly the upper, or I guess that would be his left side, um, is a pretty concave, convex, sorry. Um, and so what this is, is usually the signs are they're unable to vomit or unproductive vomiting. You might see some foam, but that's not really vomit. It's just kind of phlegm and stuff that's in their esophagus. They're usually restless. Um, and this is kind of early on pacing. So they might get up, they might get down, they might be panting, they're lethargic. They might, you might be able to notice a distended abdomen. And as time goes on, their, their abdomen is gonna become more distended. However, sometimes you see them where they're just laying and they're not doing anything. So what happens is their stomach, and we don't know why this happens. There are some things that people say that, that can decrease the um, chances of this happening. And it's usually in our bigger dogs, I should say, like Great Danes, Standard Poodles, you can see the Labradors, those kinds of things. Their stomach twists on itself. So you can see this x-ray, they call it the Smurf hat because the little bubble on the top is separate kind of because it's twisted from the bigger gas filled stomach on the bottom. So that is all that patient's stomach, but the gases in there just kind of build up and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you can only have so much room in your stomach before it either, you know, ruptures or pushes, pushes pressure on their, um, you know, their spleen or their liver and causes a whole bunch of issues. So as time goes on, more and more things happen. It's a lot, but basically be careful. And, and those are signs for bigger dogs of unproductive vomiting, restlessness, pacing, those kinds of things. The nice, the good thing is, is that um, you can go to surgery. We can go to surgery. We basically unflip the stomach look for other damage depending on how long this has been going on for and a lot of these these pets do really well um common emergencies for cats so i need to change this because we are seeing more and more um middle-aged cats so not just young male cats but um it's a urethral obstruction so they're straining to urinate they're usually painful they are painful uh because they can't urinate and their bladder is getting bigger and bigger they're hiding usually, sometimes they're vocalizing. It's a very specific, weird vocalizing, but not all cats vocalize. You might see like pre or early signs of this as a cat who is urinating outside the litter box, maybe urinating on the bath mat or on the bed or something like that. Maybe you see some um, red tinged urine or something like that. Um, so we could have a full obstruction where no urine is coming out, or we could have a partial one where, that we call fluted, which is feline lower urinary tract disorder. And basically kitties get an irritated urinary tract because you had a new roommate come in or something like cats you just, you know, they're very particular, right? So, um, supportive therapy and fluids and making sure that they don't actually get to the obstruction is very important. Um, so the reason this is very important to treat early is because it can cause liver 
or sorry, kidney damage, you know, urine, if it can't go anywhere, it's going to back up and it goes back from the bladder to the kidneys. You can have bladder rupture. It can cause issues for their heart, things like that. So, um, you know, watching for signs of this, if this, you know, just knowing that this is something that could happen is, is probably the most important thing. And if you do see any urinary issues, then to either call or come in. Um, yeah. <clears throat> common emergencies, eyeballs, all eye injuries are emergencies and because um, you never know until until you get a closer look at what's going on. Um, other emergencies that we'll see more of now, um, allergic reactions, so insect stings, vaccines maybe, drug reactions, those kinds of things. This boxer, he's already a little bit compromised with his respiratory system. He's got like a, we call it brachycephalic. So he's got the squish face. So his, um, you know, his airway is a little bit smaller, kind of like our bulldogs and our French bulldogs and our well, boxers. And um, I can't think of the other one right now. Um, but if they get stung, and we might not even know that it's a, it's the pet was stung actually, uh, but you would see signs of swelling. And that can cause, you know, obviously it's painful when their eyes are that swollen, but we're worried about respiratory as well. And then leading into, you know, shock. So, um, so you come into the hospital and we can, we can give a couple things to help with this. Um, and then coming up as well, um, heat stroke. So prevention is key here, uh, making sure that we are taking walks with our pets early in the morning. Be careful, their paw pads get really hot really easily. Um, you know, and afterwards throughout the day, just going outside for potty breaks and that's it. Um, because it is getting hotter and hotter in Oregon and heat stroke, can be very, very scary and very dangerous. Um, this picture is false. Do not stick your pet in ice. <laughs> um, first off, that can cause, you know, um, frostbite issues and things like that. It's uncomfortable to have ice on your skin, right? But also it sends them into a cooling process that's way too fast. And then what happens is they go from 104, their temperature 104 to like 97 really quickly and that's just a really big shock on their body so you will cool them off once they are taken away from you know outside away from heat with warm water so put a warm water towel not hot but warm over their body because that will cool down right as it's sitting out but it will also help their your dog cool slowly the best thing is is to have them evaluated because heat stroke that goes on can cause a it's a shock to their system so they can have like GI upset. So we'll see HGE or hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, diarrhea, sloughing, sorry, um, those kinds of things with our pets that have had heat stroke, but also bleeding disorders if it is severe enough. So it's important to, you know, get them into the car, get them into, or, sorry, get them into a cool place, give them water, see how that goes. If they're lethargic or if they're really exhausted, you know, maybe it's a good idea to have them evaluated. It's better to be safe than sorry with these things especially if your pet is older or younger. Josie gets overheated really quickly and I have to be very careful about that because she will lay in the sun and then she's panting and she doesn't get up because she's so tired from the heat. It's just, yeah, 